Can I have you uh, pass these out? That sounds like it's working now. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Reverend Will Wellman uh, with us today. Will uh, came to Nashville how long ago? About a year, about a year ago, was uh, on staff of a large Presbyterian church down in the Tampa area and uh, is up here and got to know him and invited him to do some teaching for me since uh, we need to have uh, a deeper bullpen. You know, uh, Vanderbilt won the last two games, very proud, and part of that is the strength of their bullpen. So uh, we're, we're, we're a little thin and we're looking to get deeper, so we're hoping that Will can do some teaching for us. I've also invited some of our folks who are on our congregational um, uh, team that looks at environmental uh, stuff to come, and I hope some of them uh, come as well. But if you would, welcome Will, and Will, thanks for being here. Thanks, guy. The slow clap. I like it. Well, thanks, guy. What time do I need to finish by? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to speak today about faith and ecology and conversation. This is something that's been happening for about 50, 70 years in the Christian church intentionally. It's happened periodically before that. And then I'll talk a second about the Eastern Orthodox Church, which has been doing this continuously since they were founded. Um, but this is going to be a, a quick introduction to it. So it's not going to be thorough. I'm just going to kind of introduce you to some concepts, some history and theology and scripture behind it. And please, please, please interrupt me at will. Ask questions if you have them. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about. Before I went to seminary, I did a master's in forestry. And while I was at seminary, I actually founded a nonprofit called the Ecothea Review, that it was a place to create conversation between folks in the ecological world and folks in the church world. So this is something I, I'm both interested in and have a big passion for. So I'm really excited to talk to you all. And I'd love for you to interrupt me with questions because sometimes I can just get on a train and go. So I want to start with some terms because I think it's really important to kind of set the stage with that. Um, the first one is probably the one that you're most familiar with, and that's environment. And then we'll talk about ecosystem or ecology. And then another one you're familiar with, which is creation. So when we talk about environment, the thing that's really important to remember is that an environment is, um, it's, a, it's an important term, right? We know environmentalism, the environmental movement. But one of the kind of shortcomings of the word environment is it talks about the habitat or the area that an that a, uh, individual, an organism is in. And the problem with that is, is it just kind of presents a picture where there's, you know, organisms here, trees, birds, bugs, humans, whatever you want to call it, and the environment is just the thing that they live within. Now, when we move to the term ecology, which is a relatively new term in human history, it came out in 1866 by the, um, a, a German scientist named Ernst Haeckel. And what, what ecology or ecosystem does that environment doesn't is that it talks about both the habitat, the area, but the interaction the area has with the objects, the organisms. So instead of just being a container, right, an environment for these organisms, the ecosystem is the interactions they have with each other, with the ecosystem, the environment, um, and, and with each other and the ecosystem, as well as what the ecosystem at large has with them and the relationships they're having. So ecosystem is, or ecology is so much more interactive um, and comprehensive. I think environment's a good term to use, but I think ecology or uh, ecosystem is much, much more comprehensive and better. While it's relatively new as a formal science, it's been around since the Greek classical period in the Western tradition, and even longer than that um, in indigenous communities, this idea that there are relationships between the environment and the, the organisms within it. But as a formal science, it's relatively new to the scene. And then creation, obviously, 
right? God's earth, right? The, um, the, the, the thing I want to lift up about creation, though, in the context of this talk is that creation So creation entails that uh, it's intentional. There was a purpose behind it. It's an act of love, right? That God, out of his own freedom and, his, uh, and, and God's own love, creates the earth. The other thing is there is a creator. There is a God. There is someone behind it. So in the secular world, when we're talking about ecology or environmentalism, it's coming from a perspective of this is just the earth. But as Christians, when we talk about ecology and environment, we're going a step further and saying, this was created um, by God, that this was an intentional act of love. And we'll see the implications for that in a second, why that's important. So I want to give a quick history to how we got to this point where Christians started talking about, oh, uh, this is not erasing really well. I'm going to have to have like a mosaic. Um, yeah, that's not working really well. So um, some people I want to talk about are Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson, and Lynn White Jr., but I want to specifically lift up these dates to you. 1949, 1962, and 1967. So the, the, the idea of like environmentalism or this idea of creation care, environmental stewardship is relatively new historically. And I think that these dates are not comprehensive by any means, but are really important dates to say, how did we get to this place where Christian theologians, biblical scholars, congregations, and individuals started caring about creation? So 1945, Aldo Leopold publishes a Sand County Almanac. Aldo Leopold is just a titan in so many ways. So he was one of the first people to graduate from Yale's forestry school. He went to work on for the US Forestry Service. But at that time, when they were doing environmental management or wilderness conservation, it came from a place of how can we conserve or manage this land so that it benefits humanity the most? You, you can see how that's changed now. When we talk about conservation, it's what's the best for the land as a whole? But Leopold is largely responsible for that shift from a human anthropocentric perspective to a wilderness perspective in conservation work. One of the easiest examples of something that uh, Leopold did was what's called a trophic cascade. That's just a big word for um, food web. And so what Leopold did was back uh, in, his, in his time around the 40s and 50s, they were actively hunting wolves because wolves were killing cattle. And so they said, cattle are important to humans, they feed us, they give us money, so we need to kill the things that are killing them, right? Seems pretty straightforward and, 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 and not too complicated. So what happens when you kill wolves? <clears throat> the, I heard deer, right? So the deer go up. And what happens when the deer population goes up? They're, yes, they're eating everything, right? Yeah, so, so deer numbers go up. Vegetation takes a big hit because the wolves used to keep the deer in check. And so that they would be eating, but not too much. So when they start eating too much, erosion happens. And what happened was in this area is out in the West, the erosion got so bad, it started to mess up the river systems. And the rivers were helping keep the pastures not only from eroding, but healthy. And when that happened, the pastures got really bad. So when the pastures got bad, it affected the cattle, right? So you're seeing what happens when you go from just a, a strictly human perspective and you're trying to protect cattle. Over decades, you end up hurting the cattle. And so there's this really famous word that Le Leopold came up with called a land ethic. And one of the famous things he said is we need to learn how to think like a mountain to have this higher, larger vantage point, to think in, in terms of decades and centuries instead of just what's in front of us in the present. So um, the fields of wilderness conservation and environmental ethics are largely indebted to Leopold. So around the time Leopold is doing all of this, a young woman named Rachel Carson is working for the Bureau of Fisheries. And uh, a quick fun fact for you guys, her grandfather and her niece 
um, were both Presbyterian pastors. So she had a, a kind of moral ethic that she was instilled by her family. Um, so anyhow, she's working at about the time he's writing. And in 1962, she writes this book called Silent Spring. Silent Spring is largely about the effects of pesticides, which were very unregulated on birds specifically. And so that's what Silent Spring means. If this keeps going, we're not going to have any birds. There's not going to be any noise. It's going to be silent. And so that book was huge for, for three reasons. One, it led to the ban on, uh, on DDT, which was a huge step because DDT uh, it, it was just wreaking havoc on tons of species, including eagles. Um, which was a big help in getting it banned. Um, she got the Environmental Protection Agency founded, <clears throat> which now regulates pesticides. And then three, it's considered the start of the modern grassroots environmental movement. Now, there were things happening before this, but this is kind of what precipitated that movement into a cohesive whole. So you're starting to see Right? We're seeing conservation that's not anthropocentric. We're seeing a, uh, an environmental movement that's gained enough traction that it's become a national thing. And then finally, in 1967, this guy who was a professor at Stanford and at Princeton at different times, um, he was a professor of medieval history, but mainly of uh, technology. He was a historian of technology. He wrote this groundbreaking, uh, it was just a paper, it was published in Science in 1967, called the, um, the Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. And what he did was, you know, all these people are recognizing there's, there's, there's tons of environmental issues. And he's trying to say, how did this happen? Where, where, how do, what did we do to get us here? And his, his main thing was when, when humanity changed from a scratch plow, which is just like a singular time, to a modern plow, which has a mold board. It's like a flat board that overturns the entire land. We went from farming as just family farming and uh, substance farming, sustenance farming, to farming for profit. Because with the mold board, instead of just turning over little rows, it turned over the entire land. And that allowed farmers in the Mediterranean to come up into the, the northern regions and farm areas they'd never been able to farm before because now they're not just getting this bad topsoil, they're getting all this stuff in the bottom and flipping that up and over allowed them to farm not only in these areas, but farm at a level they'd never been able to farm before. So Lynn White Jr. says that's, that's what precipitated this idea of us being part of the land to being just completely uh, overrunning the land. And taking the land is something that fed us to something that we can now extract resource and extract money from. And that comes a couple hundred years before industrialism, which just takes that into overdrive. So that's, that's what Lynn White is, is saying. But there's another part of his paper that's really important to us. And that is he puts a lot of the blame on Christianity. And he, he does this in a way, it got a huge reaction. Um, he's attacking Christianity. Christianity was obviously... Uh, uh, everyone was really defensive about it. But over time, Christians started to realize, oh, maybe he has a point here. And so two of the things he talked about was this word from Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Um, and that is dominion. And then the other part was this anthropocentric, this idea that that God only cares about humanity and humanity's flourishing. So what, what Lynn White said is, is that Christianity is this religion that uses this language of dominion, that humanity is to have dominion over creation, and that God has given this kind of divine commandment that I only care about humans, and I only care about humans flourishing. And so when the mold board, the, the modern plow was around, and industrialism came around, it was, it was just it was just kind of a hand in glove for Christians to say, this is what God wants for us. God wants us to have dominion over the world and for us to flourish off the back of creation. And so this was just kind of a, a, a no brainer for them. And so that's why Lynn White says Christianity is largely at, at, at fault. What happens is Christian theologians, Christian scholars, and, and just everyday Christians got really defensive, but then they said, oh, wait, there might be some truth in this. And they started thinking about it. And so in 1967, in the early 70s, Christians started to have something called ecotheology. 
ecotheology is the study intentionally of creation and how humans should be in relationship to that based off of scripture and theology. So when, when Christians started doing this work, they started to say, you know what? We don't need to create a new theology. We don't need to say, hey, you know, how, how do we care for creation in this like new way? What they did is they actually went back to the tradition. They went back to the scriptures and revisited them anew with this mindset of like, how can we um, see in our own tradition, this tradition that's existed for thousands of years, these scriptures that have existed for even longer than that, what do they say to us? And, and, and that's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to look at that um, in an overview. And I won't touch everything that's in your handout, but I wanted to give you more information that I'll share with you today, just so if you want to look further. But the first thing I wanted to talk about was accounts of creation. So if you look at your second page, let's just look at these. These are, obviously, when we think about creation stories, we think about Genesis 1 and 2, right? But the Bible has more than that. There's a couple other stories in there that may, might not be creation accounts as, as like in the beginning, but that talk about creation and God's relationship with creation and the role God has in creation. And so the first one is Genesis 1, and this is known as the cosmic account. God acts like a priest. It's very structured and orderly. And some of the things that they took from this, um, well, two things. This says that creation is good. And we see that the apex is not man or humanity, but the Sabbath. So creation is good is a very simple thing, but it has profound implications. And we'll continue to talk about that. But this is really important. When we think about the apex of creation, we typically say, oh, it's when humanity is created. But the seventh day, the day that God rested, is the day uh, the apex of creation. That is the end, the, the kind of the jewel on the crown. And so um, that was what they took from Genesis 1. When they visited Genesis 2, which is known as the earthly account, right? Humanity is created out of the earth. The Hebrew Adama is earth and Adam is the, the first man. Um, they saw God as a farmer instead of a priest. It's much more communal, right? There's animals around and there's a relationship. It's not that structure you see in Genesis 1 with the days. Um, and so what did they take from this? Humans are made from the earth. And um, humanity is equal to creation, right? Humanity is a part of creation. Humanity comes from creation. So the third one might not be as familiar, and this is uh, Job 38 to 41. This is one of my favorite parts of all of scripture. It's so beautiful, but it's often called the creation story part two. And if you remember Job, there's this whole long back and forth with Job and his friends. And then at the very end of the story, God speaks out of the whirlwind. And the first thing he says when he speaks or when God speaks is, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then it goes through this huge, uh, just kind of litany of things about creation. And then in 39, I want to read this real quick. Um, running around. Oh, my Bible's over here. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to read from J uh, Job 39, because I just think this is so important and it's so beautiful. Do you know when this is God speaking to Job? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young? And then just a little bit later, the ostrich wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage, for its leaves, its eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. It deals cruelly with its young, as if they were not its own, though its labor should be in vain, yet it has no fear, because God has made it forget wisdom and given it no share in understanding. When it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and its rider. So what's happening here is God's talking about a number of creatures beyond this. Uh, he talks about the wild ass. Uh, God talks about the wild ox. 
uh, the ostrich, the horse, and the hawk, and, um, and the goats. It goes on, and God keeps talking about these animals. All these animals are wild animals. None of them are domesticated. And that's really important for this story because this whole story is about Job. Job's problems, Job's issues. Job lost this, Job lost that. And Job did lose animals, but they were all domesticated. And so what God is doing is God is drawing Job's attention to the wildness, the myriad of creatures that exist beyond just Job's little world. And so instead of an anthropocentric view of the world, it's an ecocentric, it's a life-centered view of the world. It's expanding. And God's saying, these animals might not serve your needs, but they're important to me. As the creator, as the one that created them, I take an interest in every little thing that they do, from sleeping to eating to breeding to giving young. And that's a really important um, point for us. I am all over the place here. So, so that was one of the big things from, from Job, was this idea of ecocentric, this idea that, that God sees through a different lens than humanity might tend to see. And that's one of the big messages of Job overall, is that the world is much broader than Job sees it. And, and in many ways, it's beyond Job's understanding. So the fourth is one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 104. And Psalm 104 is just, it's just all about creation. It's a gorgeous song, Psalm. And I go home and read that today. But one of the things it talks about is how God is continued to be involved in God's creation. God didn't just create the world and walk away. God continues to care for each and every person, each and every organism, and each and every ecosystem. And so it talks about habitat, which is really important, that God provides habitat. And then there's this, this kind of idea of sustenance, that God continues to be involved. So when we talk about God's involvement in history, God's involvement in history also entails giving sustenance to all animals and all creatures, that everything, every living thing might live abundantly, this idea of abundance. So there's other accounts, and I've listed some of them, but these are some of the things these theologians, in response to Lynn White, are saying, you know what, this is in our Bible. This isn't something new. It's just we weren't paying attention. We got kind of caught up in this idea of industry and using the land as a resource and something that we can extract from. But what the Bible is telling us is, no, creation is good. God cares for creation. God continues to care for creation. And that humanity is not at the apex of creation, but a part of creation. So I, I, I've listed some words here under theology of creation. And so when they went to the scriptures, they also revisited the tradition, the theology, the, the, the doctrine of the church. So creation ex nihilo. Um, is, a, is a familiar term for some of you. That's just the Latin term for out of nothing, this idea that God creates out of nothing. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? There was nothing before God and God created these things. What's important from this, and I, I've kind of mentioned this before, is this idea that this was intentional. God did this intentionally. It just didn't just pop up out of nowhere. It's not just the big bang, right? God's causing this to happen. And it's an act of love. God... Um, God, God chooses out of God's own freedom and out of love to create. And so those, those were really important to think about, okay, when we're thinking about creation, what are, what are the things we're lifting up and we're pulling into this? The other things are, uh, that come out of this, uh, this ex nihilo is transcendence and eminence. So this is kind of, getting into the theological weeds, but the point I want to make is that, and this is really important in the Reformed tradition, this idea of transcendence, that God is distinct and different from God's creation. So there's a word called pantheism, which just means that everything is God. And as Christians, we don't believe that. As Christians, we say there is a separation between God and God's creation. There's, God has a sovereignty over creation. But there's another side. There's a flip side to that. We don't believe, like deists, that God just creates creation and walks away and just leaves it. We believe that God continues to be involved, that God is deeply, intimately, and always involved in God's creation. And that's what eminence is about. So there's a separation, but there's a continued relationship. And so when you pair these things, you're starting to see a Christian theology develop around, around creation and how we're to relate to it and how God relates to it. And then um, I talked about creation is good. 
I, I feel like I'm just confusing y'all writing on here. Am I? Can you still read it? All right, all right. If it gets too bad, just yell at me. Um, so creation is good. It, this is important. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple, but there's some profound elements to when we talk about creation is good. One is if something's good, you want to take care of it, right? You don't want to let it go to waste. You have a responsibility toward it. And so it talked about if creation is good, we have a responsibility to keep it healthy, to keep it functioning, to keep it, to keep it good, to keep it in balance. The other thing this, this teaches us, um, it's opposed to dualism. So this isn't as important to us as it was in the early church, but there is these two kind of heresies that existed in the early church. And um, St. Augustine, before he became uh, a Christian, was involved in one of them, and it's called Manichaeism. Uh, the other one is Gnosticism, and you might have heard that word. But the idea behind these two, two belief systems is that essentially there is a good part of the world and there's a bad part of the world. And the material, you know, the things around us that we can touch and feel are bad. And the spiritual is good. And so in those, those belief systems, the world doesn't really have any meaning to us. It's more, what are we doing spiritually and where is that leading us? But as Christians, in a system that says, not we say it, but God says that creation is good, we do not have this dualism, right? We believe that both the material and the spiritual are good, and that God has created not only both of them, but God cares for both of those worlds or both of those realities. And so that's really important when we start thinking about, okay, what's our relationship to earth, and what is the kind of commandment or the way that God is calling us to care for it? Um, these last two I'm just going to briefly touch on. There's some scripture there uh, to give an idea of what they're talking about, but plane of values is simply this idea that God did not create humanity over creation, but as a part of creation. And so instead of a hierarchy of like humans, domestic animals, and wild animals, God sees the world on a plane, on a flat. And there's, there's humans here who God loves for specific reasons. There's wild animals here who God loves for specific reasons. And then there's domestic animals who God loves for specific reasons. But God has God's own reasons for loving those. And it's not our reasons. And so there's a word called theocentric that comes up a lot. And what theocentric means is that the value of animals, of organisms, of ecosystems is based on God's view and not humanity's view. And God declared that all things are good. And they're all good for their own particular reasons. So, um, and then God's continued provision uh, on the next page. That's just what we talked about with Psalm 104, this idea that God has continued to be involved intimately with creation and to care for the things within creation. So I'm going to stop there for a second and see if you'll have any questions Whoa. Uh, before I move to stewardship. No, that could be good or bad. All right, we've got, we've got 20 minutes. We can, we can do this, guys. Okay, so this is going to be the part that I'm going to talk about, and you're going to be like, no, let's not do this, because I want to talk about Hebrew etymology. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But it's going to be really fun, I promise. So Hebrew etymology. What happened is when Christianity and when Judaism were founded, they spread, right? And when they spread, what happened? The languages that they wrote their scriptures in we're not known by certain groups, and so it got translated. This happens over and over again, right? We're reading translated Bibles. Well, one of the worst things that ever happened was when they started translating it into European languages and into English, they translated this word we're going to look at into dominion, right? So if you flip to the next page, we're going to jump a page where it says accounts of stewardship. Um, Taylor, would you read Genesis 1? The just the top part. Thanks. 
So when you hear dominion, what comes to mind? With ownership? Yeah. What else? Kingdom? Control? So these, these are words that are largely like, like I think ownership's a great word. It's, it's mine. I can kind of do with it what I want, right? This word has been used over and over again throughout Christian history to kind of say, this is our right. It's our right to just extract an environment completely of its resources. It's our right to utilize this to create as much profit as we can. But if we, if we stop and do what these Christians are doing in response to Lynn White's article, they said, let's go look at the Hebrew. Let's see what the Hebrew says. And not only let's see what the Hebrew says, but let's see how it's used in the Bible. So the, the word for dominion is this word radah. Radah is a Hebrew word. It shows up 27 times in the Old Testament. So we have a, a chance to see it outside just its use in Genesis. And what it, uh, what it would best translate into is kingly responsibility. And as people that live in a democracy and don't have kings, we could just think of it as responsibility. But it, it, it is coming from this idea of a king's responsibility. Now, in the context of the Old Testament and the use of this word, it's really important to think about our Old Testament history, right? When, when Saul came on the scene, the first king of Israel, it was a gift from God. It was a relinquishment of God's authority to Saul, right? So first off, we have to think about it's something that is given. There's a creator that has ultimate authority or sovereignty. So it's a, an authority given. It's also a responsibility that shows up over and over again in Kings and Samuel, this idea that kings have a responsibility for Israel. And so I want you to go um, under stewardship and under dominion. I've listed from Psalm 72, 8, a passage. Would someone read that first passage from Psalm 72, 8? Thanks. Thanks. And then if you'll hold on one second. So this is speaking about Solomon. Traditionally, this psalm is held to be speaking about Solomon and Solomon's kingship. And so how does it define dominion? Well, we go to verses 12 and 14. Thanks. So this isn't dominion in the sense of power and ownership, and I'm just going to do whatever I want. This is dominion in the sense of you do have a responsibility and maybe ownership, but it's an ownership and a responsibility that looks like taking care of being responsible, of, of, of lifting oppression and violence from people's lives. And so when we start to think about what dominion means in terms of creation, we have to see it through this lens and not just the lens of an English, English word called dominion that we, we associate with kind of barbaric kings. So they, the, the theologians that are doing this, the biblical scholars that are revisiting these words and looking at them, they go to the next word, which is subdue. And this is a Hebrew word, kabosh or kavash. And this is another word I would think has associations of almost violence, uh, ownership, these kind of things that we saw with dominion. But if we look at subdue, we look at its uses in the Bible, what it's talking about over and over again is what I would consider when I was in, uh, in, uh, in first grade, I had to always go up to the board and spell stuff. And I would get so nervous and I would always misspell everything. And that happens now, you know, I'm almost 40 and I'm still doing it. You guys are making me nervous. So anyhow, so I, I've misspelled cultivate and you can, well, now I think I got it right. But anyhow, I think cultivates a much better use of this word because what we see in the Bible is there is this sense of subduing, but it's subduing in a way that brings life, not subduing to bring death or destruction, but bringing life. The easiest translation of this word, I think, would be weeding. What do you do when you weed? You're doing a little destruction, right? But you're doing it in the sense that the garden as a whole can flourish. And so that's what this means. And you can see from that example in Micah, he will again have compassion upon us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. 
So God is treading iniquities so that we can be spiritually healthy, spiritually whole. It it is an action of, of minor destruction to bring out a flourishing of life. The next words, uh, till and keep, come from Genesis 2, 15. And Taylor, would you read that on the page under the Genesis 1? Thank you. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree with a pleasant sight. This life also in the midst of blood, even the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God made the tree. Thanks. So those words, till and keep, are not as bad as dominion and subdue. But I want to just briefly look at those and see what they're saying when we look at the actual Hebrew and its uses throughout Scripture. So again, we look at till. Um, Till is not as bad of a word. And I think till is something that we would associate more with cultivation or farming or taking care of. Um, But you can use the word serve. And actually, that word is actually used to translate this word, which the Hebrew is abad. Uh, and if you look at the passage I have there from Deuteronomy 6.13, so this is the exact same word, abad, but you'll see that the English translation is a little different. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. And then we come to this word keep, which in Hebrew is shamar. And I think uh, probably the best way to translate this would be preserve. So... Um, you see from two places, and one of these is very famous. So Exodus 6 is the ironic blessing, which begins, the Lord bless you and keep you. And then from Psalm 121, uh, verses 7 and 8, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forevermore. So this idea of keeping is to preserve, again, moving toward life and not toward death, moving towards creation and abundance and flourishing and away from destruction. So I wanna do a quick thing and just listen to these passages that Taylor just read, but listen to me translating with these words that we've looked at and I'm using in place of. So from Genesis one, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have responsibility over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and cultivate it, and have responsibility over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's drastically different, and those words are so much closer to the Hebrew than dominion and subdue. And you can just see, just hearing that sentence, it gives a huge shift into our relationship to creation and how we are to be um, responsible and stewards of it. And you can do it again for Genesis 2. I'll just jump to that last sentence. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to serve it and preserve it. So I don't think that one's as bad, and that hasn't had the historical uh, problems and repercussions that dominion has. But still, you're seeing something about we have a relationship, we have a responsibility toward this. God is is asking us to do something that is to steward this, to care for it. So there's lots of other accounts of stewardship in scripture. I've listed some of those there. There's also examples of how people can be bad stewards and how that upsets God. Would someone uh, mind reading that Ezekiel passage? Thank you. So you're you're seeing God has set limits so that all creatures can have flourishing and abundance. But when those limits are exceeded, it messes up things for people. You see the same thing in Isaiah. Ah, you who join house to house, who add field to field, 
until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For 10 acres of vineyard should yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield a mere ephah. So what's happening is when humanity is not listening to the commandments of God, not living within the structures that God has set up, the land responds to that and almost punishes them. When they live within the land and they follow the commandments of God, the, the land provides abundantly for them. And where do we see this? Well, look back up to accounts of stewardship at Leviticus 25. Listen to what, what's being said here. You shall observe my statutes and faithfully keep my ordinances so that you may live on the land securely. The land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and live on it securely. God is making a direct connection between God's statutes and commandments, the way they live, the way they worship, the way they, they live in community with the way the land provides for them. If they, if they live within those commandments, if they follow those statutes, the land will provide in a way that is abundant, that they can have abundant life, that they can flourish alongside their neighbor, whether that be a human or an animal. So this you see throughout scripture over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, because these are agrarian people. These are people whose lives are heavily dependent upon the land providing for them. So um, there's lots of other accounts of improper stewardship as well, and you'll see those, uh, some of them I've listed. Again, it's this idea of going beyond the, the bounds of what God has commanded or the limits that God has set forth, and there's always this connection to the land kind of not providing when they do that. So we're, we're in the home stretch, and I want to talk, we've been talking a lot about the Old Testament, and we've been talking a lot about Hebrew and stuff. So I want to move to the New Testament, and specifically Jesus Christ. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so that's a great example. So global warming or climate change is caused from um, uh, insane levels of CO2, not normal levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, which, which traps the sun heat and causes lots of shift in climate. Um, you could think about pollution as another thing. It's sending too many toxins out into the air that the air can't handle. Environments are resilient. They can take pollution. They can take uh, carbon dioxide. They can't take it at these huge industrial levels. Um, and so what we're seeing is our actions of having technology and resources, but not using those in a way that's uh, limited, that, that, that's used in a way that's thoughtful, but instead just kind of going just bonkers with it. It just, it destroys the land. It's the same thing you're seeing here, yeah. Um, and, and like biodiversity, uh, habitat destruction, same thing. Humanity has taken too much land. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, it, it's humanity. Yep, we, we um, are to live in a way that uses the land so that all things may flourish and not just us or our group. Uh, our neighbor to the north, uh, a farmer, a writer, a poet, Wendell Berry has said, do unto others downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. And it's a real folky saying, but I think it really drives the point home. You should treat those downstream from you the way you want those upstream to treat you. Um, and I just think that's a really good way to drive this home. So I'm going to close really quick talking about Jesus Christ and this word, our term cosmic salvation. And I want to start with a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a famous theologian, um, uh, was killed by the Nazis, is, is just a profound, profound theologian, has a huge impact on tons of uh, Christians. But he also is not an eco-theologian, but he talked about a lot of these things and kind of preceded it in many ways. So he said, in Christ, we are offered the possibility of partaking in the reality of God and in the reality of the world, but not in the one without the other. The reality of God discloses itself only by setting me entirely in the reality of the world. And when I encounter the reality of the world, it is always already sustained, accepted, 
and reconciled in the reality of God. This is the inner meaning of the revelation of God and man and the man, Jesus Christ. This isn't a stretch. This isn't something that's not in the text. It's all over the text. Creation comes to life through the person of Jesus Christ. And when we encounter Jesus Christ, we are encountering the incarnate one, the son of God, who holds all things together and in whom all things came into being. We see that in John 1 from the prologue. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, panta in the Greek, all things came into being through him and without him, not one thing came into being. And we see this, this same language of all things coming into being in Colossians, which is also known as the Christ hymn. It's believed to be one of the earlier parts of scripture, something that the church, the early church used to sing together, um, like a psalm. And then if you look at Hebrews 1, which I haven't listed, but Hebrew 1 talks about this as well, this idea that the son, uh, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is responsible for things coming into being. Now, when we talk about salvation, we often see salvation through the eyes of how will God save humanity? What is the, the saving act of God through Jesus Christ? But when we look at scripture, and this is all over the Old Testament and the New Testament, it has a, a span of creation that's much more broader than just humanity. It talks about animals. It talks about earth. It talks about creation. And I just want to give a couple examples here. Um, so if you look at Genesis 9, and I've, I've listed two different ver or four different verses, when God makes God's covenant with Noah, guess what? God's making that covenant with creatures and with earth as well. I remember when I started studying this, I was just shocked by, I was like, how did I not see these things when I was reading? But look at that first one. As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many that came out of the ark. And then at the end of that next passage, I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God is making a covenant, not only with Noah, but with every living creature that, that Noah saved in the ark. And in the second part, God says with the earth. If you look at Psalm 35, uh, 36, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save, save salvation, humans and animals alike, O Lord. Mark 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. It's a resurrected Jesus speaking right there. Um, Romans, uh, you see in that second line, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealings of the children of God. And then lastly, Ephesians on the last page, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things, things in heaven and things on earth. That's the end of history. The beginning of history is, is God creating all things on heaven and earth. At the end, God will reconcile, redeem, and renew all things on heaven and earth. Um, I'll stop there. I've talked a lot. Do you all have any questions before I close up? I know we're at the end of our time. I'm kind of left with now. Yeah. 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 This was just the introduction. So, but there's lots of ways you can get involved. And I always tell people don't get overwhelmed and try to solve climate change. Do what uh, you want to do. Go garden, go pick up a piece of litter, take someone to a park. These are the things that get us involved because when we get involved, we start to care in a way that's not. Oh, I've got to do this. It's not a chore, right? Oh gosh, this is beautiful. Or, oh, I really like growing my own food. Those are the things that will motivate us to care in bigger ways and then start thinking about stuff like climate change or pollution or habitat loss. Let me uh, close this in prayer and I'm happy to stick around and talk if anyone has any questions. And thank y'all. Holy, gracious, loving God, thank you for this day and this chance to gather as your people. Thank you, too, for your creation and the way it provides for us and all living beings. 
Remind us we do not stand apart from creation, but rather are a part of it. And that as creatures created in your image, you call us to be stewards, caretakers of every part and parcel of this world. Remind us of this call and may your spirit embolden us to live it out daily. We ask all these things in the name of the, the one in whom all things came into being, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much. And uh, Guy has my email. i happy to share books and stuff like that if you ever have any questions. Thank you all.